Thank you very much. Quite a hard act to follow there. And I don't think any of my people may even know what a record was, so I don't have any record stories. Uh, some of them might have thrown some eggs in their time, but uh, you never know. Um, so my title is a bit interesting in one way, and rather strange and possibly incongruous. I'm talking about lies, but then I'm talking about dead people and bones. But actually, they're a phenomenal resource, and they can tell us a huge amount about the past, about the people themselves. And they're that lovely direct link. So I'm very privileged to actually learn directly from those people who've lived through extraordinary times and different periods. This is a glorious vista of a Victorian cemetery. This is Brompton Cemetery. And they're magnificent places and quite, you know, as you would expect, I rather like cemeteries. And I often wander through them, but I'm not always digging them up. Um, but this is wonderful because you have on these inscriptions and these memorials and graves the names of individuals, how old they were, when they died, and maybe some of the deeds that they have done and occupations. As a resource, that's phenomenal because you have that biographical information. You're able then to learn from them. But you don't always have that. So how then do we go about, as an osteologist looking at your bones, trying to piece that together? Everybody has a name. We don't know everybody's names when we then find them. So places like the cemeteries are wonderful because they can help us with that connection. Those are very emotive. They are unique relationships that people have with the families who are there, friends who may be able to go and visit people. People who've done amazing things, they will then go to visit them. But we're trying to then reconstruct the lives of people that we don't always know the names of them. So we're trying to create and build that story of their lives. Archaeology does that process wonderfully. It's revealing the history of the city and London and other parts of the world layer by layer. You're revealing all those different parts and you're able to try to put them back and reconstruct them. And therefore, you're getting a lovely mixture of the archaeological and the historical. You're revealing elements of artefacts that people have left behind, buildings, but also they themselves. And they're what I'm really interested in as an osteologist. I'm interested in their bones, what they can actually tell me about a particular time, about them as a person and about the community that they may have lived in and the population overall. So collectively, they are really the most phenomenal resource for learning. This lady is a rather lovely lady as well because she has a rather lovely tinge of green to her that you might be able to see and lovely green teeth. Now, that's a lovely story as well, and the connections, because she comes from a site at the Royal Mint. And that is a site, as an archaeological site, that's like a lovely layer cake of history. You have land that belonged to Holy Trinity Priory. It's then purchased as an emergency burial ground. It then has a Cistercian Abbey built on top. It then has other buildings built at different periods of time, and then has the Royal Mint put on top. And when they make the coins, they throw the wastage away and all of the people that were underneath a lot of them were turned green, and then it was developed in the 1980s. So as a site, it's fantastic. It's really sort of like looking and charting the history of one part of London, but then connecting you to those people who lived at those different times. We're very fortunate um, at the museum to look after about 20,000 individuals, so a very large number of individuals that span over 2,000 years the history of London. So you're really learning about the city, you're connecting to those people through time. We have a whole variety of burial types. So we may have a single burial, double burials, multiple burials, mass graves. They will tell us whether you are low status, high status, is it monastic, is it from a hospital, or is it a catastrophe? So again, that's telling us and informing us all of that information about the time and the period. This particular image is of a coffin plate from St Bride's Church, and often it's the higher status individuals that will leave us those documentary sources. And this lady, uh, Judith McFarlane, is a rather lovely lady who has a glorious set of gold false teeth. So she has another connection as well to things that are changing and developing through time. And interestingly, the year that she died in 1832, the connection with that is key in medical history because that was the passing of the Anatomy Act. So all things have different connections that you can then link to. 
What we're doing osteologically then is actually really trying to map you osteologically. So we can look at you temporally, but then we can also look at you geographically. So where are you being buried? The different places that people are being buried. We can look at different parts of London. Can we see similarities? Can we see differences? So it's a fantastic way, again, of mapping, charting history, looking at those connections through time and through place. <coughs> Anatomically, obviously, I'm very interested in you. You lovely people are all fully flesh, but I'm really interested in your bones. And uh, your bones are fantastic. Your skeletons are marvellous. I won't live long enough, sadly, to look at all of yours, but uh, unless I have, you know, elixir of ever life. Um, what we're looking at is literally the connection of you anatomically. We're trying to see which bones are present. Can we look and discern the characteristics that might help tell us, are you an adult? Are you a child? how old you are as an individual biologically. Are there things that have affected your skeleton? Have you got a disease that I may be able to see? Which unfortunately really I have to see things that are chronic or traumatic. If it's acute, it kills you too quickly. Can I measure you? Can that tell me about stature? Can that tell me about head shape? I'm really looking to see whatever bones are present to try to build that picture. We don't always have complete people. We may only have parts of people, but all parts will tell us a story and they'll tell us about that person's life, and then they'll also build that picture up again about the population. So anatomically, that's really key for us, osteologically looking directly at the bones and teeth. Now, what we're also looking for are patterns, and some of the patterns we might see will be things like diseases. And diseases are very interesting because they will affect us all in very different ways. They will affect males and females differently, the young, and the old. They will tell us about particular points in time. We can look at them and chart changes of them through time. We can look at the evolution of the disease. We can also see how it may have affected you grossly. Has that caused really severe deformities? How that would have affected your life? How you would have coped with that? How you would have lived with it? What would the psychology of having some of these things been like? This particular individual is very sad, really, because this is the cranium, the main part of the skull, of a child of about 10 or 11 who unfortunately had congenital syphilis. And they're from the medieval period. They were excavated from a site at Spitalfields Market. And if you think about it, that poor child throughout their entire life just had to cope with that disease, which has very gross changes and effects to the skeleton. So not only was their face affected, but the rest of their postcranial. They, however, would have been cared for because that hospital site became one of the biggest medieval hospitals in Europe. So that, again, might give you an indication of the type of care and some sort of treatment they may have had. You can see how grossly affected that has eaten into the bone. So it's a really very nasty disease, and it can be passed from mother to child, or it can be acquired. They're also very, very important because they were dated to be being pre-1492 and this big debate of when did syphilis arrive. So we were able, as archaeologists from that site, to sort of raise our hands in a cheer to say, we have the earliest and one of the earliest. But I'm not sure that's an accolade, really, that you <laughs> aim to try to get. But it's very interesting that we're seeing those changes, and then, again, you're trying to extrapolate and look again at community connections and care. The other thing that we can do now is we can look inside your body. So not only do I get the delight of looking at your bones, you can then sample them and sample teeth. You can do radiographs and look inside. Some diseases may be then within you, but I just can't see them with my naked eye. So you need other mechanisms and methods. And you can sample now and you can extract elements from the teeth, the stable isotopes, and that can tell us really what you're eating. Where have you come from? Your mobility. We know that London is a cosmopolitan city, it's very diverse, and people have come from all over the world throughout time. The teeth can really tell us and pinpoint where you're coming from and then when you're ending up in London. We can also look at the actual DNA of the pathogen of diseases. So we can look at you genetically as an individual to actually see what your hair colour was, your eye colour, and where you've come from again, but also the diseases themselves. The lady that you saw with the lovely green teeth from the Royal Mint, that has East Smithfield, a catastrophe cemetery site. And the Black Death killed many millions of people, but no one was really sure what caused it. By us being able to look after individuals from that site, with the development of ancient DNA, they were able to sample a number of individuals, and they were able to extract 
the actual DNA of the pathogen of the bacteria of Yersinia pestis. So again, we could whoop with joy that we had found the causative agent of the Black Death. So the researchers that came to work with us and sample did a phenomenal piece of work there and reconstructed that genome. So you're always learning from these people. It's never static, it's always constant, as London is always changing and developing as well. Lovely teeth. We're looking at patterns again. So we can start to look at your dental health. We can see how things have changed through time. Unfortunately, the advent of sugar has not really done us any good in many ways. And we can see also interventions that people may have done. We know there are very early interventions, but for us, Within our collections, they're really beginning in the 18th and 19th century. And again, usually if you have the means to go to the dentist. And this lady, Sarah Lamb, again from St Bride's, has a rather splendid gold filling. And that's interesting because, again, you're looking to see people trying to do things that might aid healing something that's painful, but also the cosmetic aspect to it as well. And this rather glorious rotund Georgian. I'm not sure all Georgians went around like that. But some of the diseases that we might see you can then link sometimes and build a picture of an individual. And he's rather glorious in the excesses of life that he's having uh, sitting in that chair. And some of the things we might see in the bones, you can then link to that. So you can see various pictures of the skeletal parts. And you've got a picture up there. We've got the hip joint that's got osteoarthritis. And that can sometimes be degenerative because of age and wear and tear, but also could be if you're a bit sort of rotund and overweight, you're putting a lot of pressure on. You might see in the corner there a really nasty abscess from the decay. So again, if you're ingesting lots of those sugars. Lovely big toe there with gout. So again, if you're having a rather sort of rich lifestyle, you may then suffer the effects of gout. And at the museum, we have a lovely sedan chair of a gentleman who had to have the plate extended because he had a big bandaged foot. So although we have that small bone, that causes you a lot of problems. And then you have your vertebra, so that's the lovely bones in your spine. They should really be all nice and separate, so you can do your wiggly movements. But this person has a disorder called DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. I will test you later. <laughs> and that just rolls off your tongue as it rolls off your bones. And that will fuse one side, so you become quite stiff. And we tend to sometimes see that in older males and usually from a, a richer status. So again, sometimes you can build these glorious pictures up of people from the bones and what you're seeing. Have to be cautious because just because you see that sometimes doesn't always indicate that. But if you've got the context where we have the archaeological context and the osteological context, then you can build that picture. We can also do personal histories and stories, which I find fascinating. I probably know more about some of these people than I do my own family. Um, so a sort of bookend two here, we have the rather lovely lady from Spitalfields, a Roman lady who was found at the end of the 1990s. The site had uh, 14,000 individuals and we look after 10 and a half thousand and they are predominantly all medieval, but there were some Roman burials. And she's exceptional. She was found in the most phenomenal sarcophagus, a sealed lead coffin. And so the integrity of her bones is really amazing and she's very complete. She has bay leaves behind her head, which if you look at them, you would not think they were 2,000 years old. She has jet, she has glass, and she has gold thread. So she is clearly high status, and she's come into London from somewhere else, but from high status. When they sampled her at the time, they were only able to say, well, she's probably Mediterranean, but recently, with other analysis, they're showing that she's actually come from Rome. So she has come from Rome to <coughs> London. This is one of the facial reconstructions they did in the 1990s. It'd be interesting to see if they do it again to see where they've refined it, what the features may then uh, look like now. More recent research has also shown that she probably was prepared and embalmed. There's pine resin and amber resin on her. And my colleague who's doing some work, hopefully they'll be able to do DNA, which again will give us a, a better picture of her. We don't know her name, but we're gradually sort of building up that personal history and story uh, of her life. If we move then to the 18th, 19th century, we then, because of the coffin plates, as you saw earlier, have that biographical information so you know who these people are. You're able to go to other documentary sources and, again, you can build up this picture. And this gentleman is one of my favourites. He's Richard Gideon Hand. He's from the Hand family, who their claim to fame is being the creator of the Chelsea Bun and had the famous Bun House in uh, Chelsea. 
and the uh, George II and George III used to go and have lots of buns there with them. And you have the calling card, so you can then go to business directories. And the coffin plate is giving you that information. The painting I found recently, uh, the gentleman to do with the Staffordshire Militia, because he was in the Staffordshire Militia and was known as Captain Bun, uh, which was rather glorious. And I didn't have a picture of him when I first learned about him, but they think this might be then a portrait of Richard Hand. And he sounds a lovely character. He died in 1836 at 84 and used to go around Chelsea in a fez and a long gown. So it became quite a sort of a character. So you begin to get these embellishments of someone and again that connection to their community, to their life and really that living history of them and the legacy that they leave behind. Everybody leaves us that legacy, it's just us trying to work out how we can then build and construct it. So looking to the future, well the future I think is very exciting, it's very fascinating. I think for us particularly it will be related to the DNA and the genetics because they're very interested in looking at us genetically. And that really will be the forefront of the development of how we then unravel and learn more about these individuals. So we're exploring and investigating these people in, in greater depth. So the future hopefully uh, looks bright from an osteological uh, point of view. <laughs> and then lastly, I thought I'd do a story of my own. And it links back to the Brompton Cemetery. I've known Brompton Cemetery all my life. I uh, don't know if I'll know it in death, possibly, um, but I've walked through it ever since I was a child. I've always been fascinated by reading all of the names, the ages. Everybody seemed really old when they were dead, but also when you're living, when you're little and at primary school, everybody over the age of 10 seemed ancient. So I was always fascinated by that and what people had done. But my primary school was meant to have been built on the foundations of what had been Beatrix Potter's house. And apparently she would walk through the cemetery and was inspired by some of the names that she would see on the gravestones. And one of those is Nutkins. And of course, she wrote the story Squirrel Nutkins. So I don't know what that one may be. Whoops, a message from Beatrix. Uh, Maybe <laughs> the Nutkins that she, you know, she saw. But I thought it was fantastic to have that connection. That's my connection, and I'm linking through to them. So really, overall, the, the sort of the unravelling and the reconstructing uh, of the past lives from the dead is fascinating. It's full of challenges, it's full of complexities, but they provide this wonderful, colourful vista of the past, and that's linking for them as people, but also to time and to place. So thank you. <laughs>